Hiya, today we're going to look at uh, AC 2.3. This is how the forms of punishment meet the aims of punishment. So by forms of punishment, we're talking about the sentences that are handed out in courts in the UK and Wales, uh, sorry, uh, England and Wales um, today. So that's imprisonment, fines, um, community services and discharges. And obviously the aims of punishment are our five aims of punishment, reparation, retribution, rehabilitation, uh, deterrence and protection. So this is how these two combine. So what we're really looking at is, as I said, these five aims of punishment. Remember that 2003 Criminal Justice Act reference in my previous PowerPoint, AC 2.2, and how these are linked to our sentencing framework. And the sentencing framework is basically the idea that in this country, we have four types of sentence. Imprisonment, community sentences, fines and discharges. So obviously this PowerPoint is going to look in detail at these. And this here is a, um, is a diagram of our sentencing framework for offenders aged 18 years and over. So you can see we start, we go from right to left. Here's our custodial sentences. These are over here. Our community orders. These are all the things it could be, unpaid work, activity, program, prohibited activity, curfew, exclusion, residence, and so on and so forth. Then we've got the fine, and then we've got the absolute or conditional discharge. And of course, compensation and ancillary orders can run underneath those, particularly compensation. So that's what we're looking at as we progress through this PowerPoint. So let's start with imprisonment. So Imprisonment, prison sentences are handed down by courts for the most serious offences uh, when the public needs to be protected by removing an offender from society. Almost half of all prisoners in the UK, um, so those that are locked up, have been convicted of uh, sexual or violent offences. So the reality is, if you think about those type of offences, violent sex offences, there's, a, there's the thought of protection. We need to lock these people up so they cannot inflict their, um, their sex offences, their violence on other members of the public. So it's a useful stat to bear in mind there when you're arguing the case that imprisonment is for protection, one of our aims of punishment. So there are three types of prison sentence and you'll need to know these because these link to how the aims of punishment uh, link in with these sentences. So we've got indeterminate and life sentences. We've got determinate sentences and suspended sentences. And obviously I'm going to look at all of these in detail in the forthcoming slides. So let's start with our life sentences. Now, obviously the life sentence is the most serious punishment a UK court can hand down. So there's quite clearly an element of retribution when we give out a life sentence in a UK court. If it is a life sentence, the judge will set the minimum time that the offender must serve in prison before they can be considered for release, for parole. So, and even when they are um, put on parole, the sentence still hangs over them. The sentence remains for life. So if they re-offend, back into prison they go, any time for the rest of their life. So there is, a, once again, as well as retribution, life sentences carry with them this, air, uh, this aura of public protection because it's there for the rest of your life, whether you're in prison or not. Now, the parole board, obviously, if they're considering whether they're going to let someone out after a life sentence. They've got to consider whether the release is safe or suitable. So still protection and retribution is there in their minds. And if they're released on license, they have to follow specific rules and conditions and be supervised by the probation service. And if you need to look, at, you, look you can look at my previous PowerPoint on the probation service to get more detail on that. But there's an element there, obviously, if they're being supervised by the probation service of rehabilitation in there. So you can see now how we're starting to draw these aims of punishments in to the various different sentencing options open to courts in today's society. And of course, if when they're on license, they break the terms of those license, they are recalled to prison. 
And so there's our final aim of, uh, ret of deterrence there. So as you can see, with life sentences, we've actually got um, four of those five aims in there. Reparation, not so much, but retribution, protection, rehabilitation, deterrence, in a sense, are there. So let's continue on with our look at life sentences. Now, they're mandatory, in other words, compulsory, if anyone's found guilty of murder. So if you take a life, you will be given a, um, you will be given a life sentence. So again, there's the element of for murder, retribution, protection and deterrence sitting in there. At the same time, a life sentence can be given for more serious offences, such as rape, um, so you don't have to give a life sentence, but you can do. So there again, you have retribution, protection, deterrence. Whereas it's mandatory for murder, it's not mandatory for rape. It is if you commit a second rape then. Um, and a judge can sentence an offender to what is called a whole life order. Now that is when they will never be released except in exceptional compassionate circumstances. And once again, we've got retribution, protection and deterrence. And to give you an idea, some stats here, in September 2022, we had 8,551 prisoners, of which about 8,220 were male, 331 were female. 9.5% of the prison population were serving some form of life sentence. So approximately just under 10% of the prison uh, people in prison are serving some form of life sentence. And if you want an example that you could use a case study, you can use this guy here, Hashima Bidi. He was the brother of the Manchester Arena bomber. He was sentenced to life with a minimum term of 55 years. And that is the longest minimum term to date. I don't believe there's been one set longer than that. Um, that has ever been set by a judge in our court. So he has to serve 55 years of that life sentence before he's even considered for parole. So he was 23 years old when he was sentenced. Sentence. He couldn't get the whole life term because when the crime was committed, he was under 21. And you've got to be over 21 to have a whole life term. So he'll be 88, no, sorry, 78 before he's even considered for parole. He'll effectively spend a minimum of 55 years in prison. I think he is in Belmarsh prison at the moment. Um, whole life sentences are usually given to offenders who've committed multiple murderers. Um, I've had a brief look. There were 63 whole life sentences as of June 2022 in our prison system at the moment so 63 people are serving a sentence where effectively they're never getting out so some examples of these people you've got Robert Maudsley uh, committed three murders whilst in prison uh, even though he'd received a, a, a life sentence for a single murder in 1970 he's alleged to have eaten part of one of the people's brains in prison he's known as the cannibal um, he's actually kept in solitary confinement in a specially built cell in Wakefield Prison. Uh, it's a specially built plastic cell in the basement of Wakefield Prison and he has been in solitary confinement since 1983. So over f nearly 40 years in solitary confinement in a specially built cell. Um, our longest serving uh, female on a whole life sentence is Rosemary West. Uh, convicted in 1995 for the murder of 10 women and uh, 10 women and girls at her home in Gloucester with her husband Fred, who committed suicide. Um, in 97, uh, Jack Straw, the then Home Secretary, uh, said she would never be released, so she was given a whole life term. And this guy here, uh, Michael Adebolajo, he was one of the two men that murdered um, the drummer Lee Rigby. Um, he was given a whole life term. Uh, Adiba Wala, who was his accomplice, was given a 45 minimum, 45 year minimum term, uh, and he is also in Belmarsh Prison. So, the examples of people that have been given those terms. And if you go to this link here, um, only last week um, someone else was given a uh, whole life term in this country, and that's the BBC link. You can have a look on uh, for, his name has escaped, escaped me at the moment. That was for killing um, his partner and their three kids. Um, so again, it's usually for multiple murders that you get whole life terms. 
If we then move on to indeterminate life sentence, slightly different from a whole life term. Now, these were actually abolished in 2012, but which meant the courts couldn't give indeterminate life sentences. Um, but um, obviously, prior to 2012, there were a number of people that had been given those sentences and obviously still serving them. Um, and indeterminate life sentences um, um, and they're sometimes called um, indeterminate for public protection, hence IPP, um, are given for people who are considered to be a significant risk to the public, usually those with mental health disorders, etc. Um, and they've been replaced by what are called extended sentences, where people have a recommended tariff, and once they've served that extended sentence, they're assessed, and if judged still to be a danger, they're kept in, and if not, they're released. Okay, tend to be for violent or sexual offences. Um, so these set a minimum time the offender must serve in prison. So there's elements of protection and retribution there. Um, the offender has no automatic right to be released. It's decided by parole board. So again, there's rehabilitation and protection there. And usually they're given by a court uh, if, the, if the offender is thought to be a danger to the public. As I said before, sometimes linked to mental health issues. So there's an element, element there of rehabilitation and protection within that indeterminate life sentence. And as of June 2022, we had 2,926 prisoners serving indeterminate sentences in this country. And that then obviously leads us on to the opposite of indeterminate, which is determinate sentences. So that is a sentence with a fixed length of time. And we had around circa 72,000 prisoners serving determinate sentences in 2022. So roughly any one time in our prison system, you've got around about 72,000 people serving determinate sentence. So they know how long their sentence will be when they'll get out. Now, usually if the sentence is under 12 months, the offender is released halfway through. If it's more than 12 months, they usually spend the first half in prison and the second half out on license. That's where it differs from this one because you're just released, you're not released on license. So there is a difference between these two. And then if you're sentenced to less than, um, less than two years, uh, you could be released on post-sentence supervision for 12 months. And that means you've got regular meetings with the probation officer and there are specified requirements. And what you're seeing here with both of these sentences is individual deterrence and rehabilitation are our aims of punishment that link in there. And then we move on to suspended sentences. And that's when the offender is given a prison sentence, but they don't go to prison. So again, it's rehabilitation, it's deterrence. And it's usually given if the prison sentence would be less than 12 months. And they could be suspended for up to two years. So there's an element of rehabilitation and deterrence. And the court could also re impose requirements such as seeing probation officers, drug treatment. So again, rehabilitation plays a factor here. And if the offender doesn't meet the requirements of the suspended sentence, so they don't attend, they don't meet with their probation officer or they don't attend drug treatment, let's say, or they commit another crime during that time, then the court can send them to prison to serve the original sentence as well as the other crime they've committed if they have committed one. And so deterrence obviously plays a key role there as well. And suspended sentences make up around four to five percent of all sentences that are given out each year across all courts. So about four to five percent of every sentence that's given out is a suspended sentence in our courts today. So if we're going to evaluate if imprisonment meets its punishment aims, and really we've discussed what those aims are, broadly speaking, it's four of the five aims. Well, retribution, does it meet the aim? Well, it's the idea that the offender deserves to be punishment and punished and the punishment should fit the crime. So obviously prison punishes people by taking away their freedom and it imposes unpleasant living conditions on them. Now, that would appear to be an element of retribution. However, what I would say is it's very difficult to say whether imprisonment gives 
this idea of just desserts. For example, how do we decide exactly what length of sentence fits the different crimes? It's a very subjective opinion. If I asked you to categorise, if we took, let's say, um, paedophilia, rape and murder, and I asked you to categorise them in from most serious to least serious, I'm pretty sure that we all wouldn't arrive at the same order of what are the top, which is the top one, the second one, the third one. It's a very subjective opinion. And you can see from this um, newspaper headline here, you know, the victim the face, the t uh, face of teen who stabbed his mate to death. No prison sentence can ever be enough, says victim's sister. So she's not happy with the sentence. So there we go. It is entirely subjective. So you can argue this. There's definitely an element of retribution. But is that retribution enough? Is it an eye for an eye? Is it uh, getting your just desserts? It's subjective. Um, if we go on with the idea of deterrence, does imprisonment deter people? Well, some people argue, yes, it does, because the risk of being sent to prison deters would-be offenders from committing crime. So there is an element of deterrence. However, if you look at our high recidivism rates from ex-prisoners, that does suggest that prison's not an effective deterrent for a lot of people, because otherwise they wouldn't re-offend. And if you want the stat to back that up, nearly half of adult prisoners are reconvicted within a year of being released from jail. So our recidivism rates are through the roof at the moment. So it would suggest that actually our prison system does not fulfill the role of deterrence. So deterrence only works, you could also argue, if would-be offenders are capable of thinking and acting rationally, such as, as right realists say, rational choice theory. But lots of offences committed under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and many offenders are poorly educated or have mental health problems. So you could argue, therefore, that prison doesn't act as a deterrent for these types of offenders because they're not acting rationally. So the deterrent element doesn't come into the, into the equation, for want of a better word. When we look at protection, incapacitation, whole life sentences will definitely keep offenders permanently off the street, so they definitely work. Um, indeterminate sentences uh, keep prisoners in jail for as long as they're deemed a danger to uh, the public. So that's definitely protection. And there's been a trend recently towards longer sentences so that the public obviously remain protected from offenders for longer. So again, definitely protection. And most prisoners are released on license and under supervision. If they become a danger, back to prison they go. So again, there is an element of protection there. And here's my little newspaper headline, the criminal so dangerous judges have given them extended sentences to protect the public. So I think you can argue that protection's there. And of course, prisons do do a good job in keeping people behind bars. I think we had one escape uh, last year in 2021. So generally, um, the prisoners don't get out. So you can use that as a, as a stat if you will want to. But of course, it's not quite as simple as that, because obviously there are some downsides. So many people argue that actually prison doesn't protect us as well as we think. They argue that prisons are school for crime, where prisoners acquire new skills, new attitudes, new contacts that often lead them to actually commit more serious crimes in the future than the ones they were originally imprisoned for. Um, obviously, most prisoners are eventually released. so. While prison might buy you a bit of temporary protection, actually it results in greater harm to come because they've acquired these new skills, etc. And of course, keeping people in prison is very costly. Critics argue that these funds could be used to pay for other ways of protecting the public. And this bar chart shows how the cost of keeping someone in prison per year has been escalating year on year out. That's 2021 there. And so if you want the stat for that, the cost to the taxpayer of keeping someone in prison for the year 2021, £48,409, so £132 a day. That is a lot of money. Um, finally, we look at reparation. Well, 
we haven't really mentioned reparation um, in any of the previous slides. That's allowing a def an offender to repair the damage caused by the offence, both to the victim and wider society. I think I would tend to argue that prison doesn't serve for reparation. However, you could say that under the Prisoners' Earning Act of 2011, prisoners who are permitted to work outside of prison to prepare for their eventual release can be made to pay a proportion of their earnings to the cost of victim support services. So that is an example of reparation. But the reality is that very few prisoners have the opportunity to earn money in this way. So I think I would argue that in general, a prison imprisonment does little to meet the aim of reparation. The other four aims, definitely, you could argue one way or another, but I think reparation has to be a no for prison, in my opinion. But you can argue what you want. Um, so, rehabilitation, well, it involves changing offender so that they no longer offend and instead lead a crime-free life. It's a goal of imprisonment, but as we know, recidivism is really bad, as these stats suggest. So, 48% of prisoners re-offend within a year of their release. Of those who served a sentence of less than 12 months, it rises to 64%. And uh, in 2021, 5,773 prisoners were recalled to prison for breach of their license conditions in between October and December, so just in three months. So does it rehabilitate? Well, you look at the stats, and then you decide how you want to argue it. I think I would be tempted to go no. Short sentences are definitely one reason for this failure. Nearly a half of all sentences are for six months or less, which means there's not enough time to get to grips with the long term problems that cause offending, you know, mental health issues, addiction. And actually, ironically, short sentences have been found to be less effective than community sentences at reducing self, uh, reducing reoffending. So probably better off giving someone a community sentence rather than a short prison sentence in terms of avoiding recidivism. And of course, education and training. Even for prisoners with longer sentences, the opportunity is to deal with the cause of their offending, prepare them for a crime-free life outside, are often extremely limited within prisons. Only a quarter of prisoners have a job to go to on release, and this is mainly because they lack the educational skills needed. And if you want a stat, over half of prisoners have the literacy skill of the average 11-year-old. So they've been failed by the education system in one way or another, and this has led, um, well, partially led to a life of crime. Not all people with a literacy age of 11 year old are criminals, but there's a high proportion of them certainly in our prisons today. And carrying on with this theme, opportunities for education and vocational training and meaningful work are limited. Being released on temporary license can allow prisoners out of prison on day release to attend work or training, improve their job prospects, but fewer than 400 a month, so 0.5% of our population in prison get this opportunity, so it's a tiny drop in the ocean. And there's a shortage of places on courses that address offending behaviour, such as anger management, etc. Uh, many prisoners on indeterminate public protection sentences remain in prison due to a lack of programmes that could then address their violent behaviour. So all in all, so that then leads us on to community sentences. Obviously, these are imposed for offences that aren't, uh, that are too serious of a discharge or a fine, but not so serious that a prison sentence is required. So a court can give a community order with one or more requirements, and you should know many of these. So it's things like supervision by a probation officer, uh, 40 to 30 hours of unpaid work or community payback. There we have some examples up there. A curfew or an exclusion order. An exclusion order just means you can't go to a certain area or a certain place. Uh, you could be given a residency requirement. So you, let's say you have to live in a supervised probation approved hostel. You could be asked to attend a group programme such as anger management, drink drivers, etc. Or you could be required to undergo treatment for drug or alcohol addiction, including testing or, um, or for treatment for mental health problems. So these are the sort of things that a community sentence can impose. So let's think about community sentences and the aims of punishment. Let's start with retribution. Um, well, I think you can argue that 
all community sentences include an element of punishment or retribution as such. For example, a curfew, an exclusion order, restricts people's movements to certain times and places, and that's definitely a form of retribution. And likewise, doing unpaid work, having to wear high-vis vests with community payback on the back, the public naming and shaming that this involves is also definitely a form of retribution. So retribution is definitely an element of community sentences. If we talk about reparation, well, definitely reparation, um, doing unpaid work to repair the damage the offender has caused a victim's property, that would be reparation. Um, equally, reparation to the whole community through unpaid work on community payback, such as removing graffiti, clearing wasteland, decorated public buildings, such as community centre, that is repayment, that is reparation, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, when we come to rehabilitation, deterrence and protection, well, it would be possible to argue that undertaking community payback, uh, or by undertaking community payback, an offender might see the effect um, that their crime has had on the community, and the result of this could be rehabilitated. It's much more likely to occur, I think, rehabilitation if the offender has undertaken a successful group programme, such as treatment for drug or alcohol addiction. Um, but whether or not community services service sentences are a form of deterrence or protection, I think that's harder to argue. Um, I think I would be going for reparation and probably rehabilitation um, with, an, uh, with an element of retribution. So I think the three R's apply to community sentences. Not so sure about deterrence and protection though for those. If we look at fines, obviously financial penalties, penalties for offending, normally given for less serious offences and therefore they're more often used by magistrates, courts, but even with more serious indictable offences, about 15% of those found guilty receive some form of fine. So the size of the fine will depend on the following factors, you should know this, the offence itself, so the law lays down a maximum fine for a given offence. Uh, the circumstances of the crime, so sentencing guidelines give a range of options depending on whether it was a first offence, how much harm was done, etc. The offender's ability to pay, so a poorer defendant will probably receive a smaller fine and or be allowed to pay in instalments. And just a little note from me, just note at the moment the textbooks are wrong. Magistrates courts now have no limit on the fine that they can impose. So uh, it is limitless. So um, it, is, it used to be 10,000, it's now, there is no ceiling on that. So just be aware of that, the textbooks are wrong. So let's think about whether fines meet those five aims of punishment. Well, retribution, yeah, hitting someone in the pocket could be a good way to make them suffer for the harm they've done. So retribution is there. Uh, however, you could argue that younger offenders under the age of 16 don't have to pay their fines. It's actually the responsibility of their parents. So it's very hard to see how that acts as retribution when you do the crime that someone else pays for it. Um, if we go with deterrence, well, a fine may make an offender reluctant to reoffend because they don't want further punishment. So that's why fines are often a common way of disposing of first time offenders. Fines could be seen as a signal that worse will follow if they reoffend. So in that way, you could argue for deterrence. When we get down to protection, reparation, rehabilitation, well, whilst the money raised from a fine may go some way to give reparation to the victim and society, for example, a really good example is the fact that um, money raised from speed awareness courses is used to finance bikeability courses in Devon. So if you are caught speeding, you go on a speed awareness course, which costs £100, I believe. Uh, that's to avoid a £100 fine and three points on your licence. Um, the after costs have been taken into effect for the trainers and, all, and the hire of the venue, all the rest of the money is used to finance bikeability courses for children in Devon. So there's an example of reparation. But it's very hard, to, I think, to see how fines provide protection or rehabilitation. Um, I think reparation, yes. Protection, rehabilitation, no, I would argue. Um, and offenders who fail to pay their fines may face prison. 
So courts could deduct fine from offenders' benefits or send in bailiffs to seize their property in the event of non-payment. So maybe there is a bit of reparation there. Um, but I think I would also argue that one of the problems we have is that lots of fines don't get paid. So in 2016, I, I cannot find the latest stats. I think the government's probably hiding it from us. But in 2016, the backlog of unpaid fines and court surcharges in this country was £747 million. Many of those fines have been written off as uncollectible. So I would suggest that this means that fines don't always meet their aims of punishment because people don't pay them. Which leads us on to our final category, discharges. Two more slides to go. When the court finds someone guilty of a minor, usually first time offence, but decides not to hand down a criminal conviction, usually they'll give a discharge. Two types of discharge, as you should know, a conditional discharge, which means the offender isn't punished unless they commit another offence within a set period of time determined by the court. And if they do so, the court can sentence them for both the original offence and the new one. And this will result in a criminal record. The key thing about the discharge is no criminal record if you're given a discharge. And you can have an absolute or unconditional discharge, it means no penalties imposed, um, where the defendant's technically guilty, but, but punishment would be inappropriate, usually because the defender is morally blameless. It's not classed as a conviction. So do they meet the aims of punishment? Well, the basic aim of discharges is deterrence. Uh, the lowest level of punishment are in effect a warning as to what will happen if this type of behaviour continues. So in general, there's a low rate of reoffending following a discharge, especially if it's for the first offence. Probably because for many first time offenders, the experience of simply going to court is, an, is stress enough and enough to make them mend their own ways. So final thing to consider, I would argue that in this respect, discharges appear to largely meet their punishment aim. So I think for a discharge, it's deterrence and very little more. So hopefully you've seen how the various aims of punishment link in with the types of punishment that we give out in today's society. Hope that's helped you. Have some facts, have some stats, have some case studies, and you should be fine for the exam. Take care and I'll see you at my next PowerPoint.